Thank you. Great to see you all, and uh, thanks for turning the sunshine on. Uh, Hillgrove, yes, is um, a regular attender here, and we enjoy coming. Thank you. We continue to work in the South Australian province and continue to uh, develop targets and uh, projects in places that are not so um, exciting for many people because we're not in the Gawler. We're in the uh, Kamantu province, the Canberra Water Division of South East South Australia. It's a great place to be. We're going to consider some of those ideas about what's possible in that area. We're going to consider some of our projects and then we're going to give a brief uh, update on our Kanmantu underground operation, which many of you have had some history in the past. Just going to quickly chuck in a couple of random slides here about a project up in uh, northwest Western Australia, which has nothing to do with us. Um, but it, it exemplifies a kind of an attitude to exploration, which I think is a great attitude to have. And it's about using mineral systems knowledge to rank or to prioritise the projects that you should be involved in or that the company wishes to be involved in, rather than chasing the random drill hole that's been drilled 20 or 30 years ago. So this project's uh, win you, as you can see on the title. It's a Rio Tinto project, and many of you in the exploration space uh, perhaps have heard of it. There was a great presentation um, put, uh, through the ARG uh, in Perth in about June this year, if I got that right, about May this year. Uh, which actually gave a great um, understanding of or where they're at, which is unusual for large companies. They don't usually share at all. Um, the way the presentation was gave, it started off with a mineral systems model that had kind of been proposed about 20 years earlier by a couple of PhD students. You can see their names there in the top of the slide. And what attracted Rio to the proposal was the fact that there's a Telfer system and so on, but there was this copper only system sitting within those sediments out there that had peculiar characteristics and it raised to them the opportunity for a much larger scale up of that style of mineralisation. The actual prospect itself was small and of no interest, but it brought them to that province as a whole. And that particular uh, uh, features about it was that the, you know, they're chasing sedimentary hosted copper systems. This is a large sedimentary basin they're looking at. It's magmatically driven. It's in a, a reasonable stratigraphic unit, whatever that rightness may or may not be. Major crustal zones associated with it. In this particular one, it's a pulsing magmatic fluid system. So there's an early dynamic a metamorphism followed by a contact or metamorphic halo arising from that magmatic intrusion at depth, which there's no evidence of within the deposit itself. But it overprints that regional metamorphism. Then there's retrograde thermal system of veins and alteration uh, with uh, magmatic style geochemical indexes. This pulsing or accordion style pulsing of the thermal energy resulting in a very large uh, copper system. It's evident in the geology when they started drilling. It was slightly different to what they were expecting, but it, we know the story. It ended up quite a large uh, copper system. You, you saw in the previous, or in that slide there, it's sitting on around 600 million tonnes um, and still open to um, continual drilling. A large change in the prospectivity of that whole basin uh, that was uh, not understood prior. Coarse grain andalusites overprinting the earlier sillimanite. Uh, copper is all late in open space. Uh, gold occurs as lectrum with a strong bismuth association, in other words, a bismuth melt type model, scavenging gold out of the fluids that are, that are within that, and, and the sulphides are overprinting everything else. And you can see a parogenetic sequence there. On the, on the is it your right? Yes, your right as well. Uh, you can see that, you know, the, the, the strat stratigraphy. Uh, in the top slide, uh, it's a turbidite sequence, very difficult to map, and they've used um, ratio of, uh, of, of elements to kind of map that out. But it's a furphy trying to chase the, the stratigraphy itself because all the mineralisation is cross-cutting cross uh, and is open style veining uh, through it. But it could appear strata bound if you just looked at how it's hosted. End of Winu. It's the concept of we, starting with basics of what you're trying to find and then doing the practical work and benchmarking against uh, that model as a way of discriminating the projects or the scalability of the projects that you're looking for. Where's Hillgrove? Where, uh, 
in the Delamere, and we're in the, the Kanmantu province. I don't like using the word in the Delamere, I know it's in the title, because it actually refers to an origin that, that affects quite a large part of southern uh, South Australia. We prefer to call it as a Kanmantu province, uh, referring to the Cambro or division sequence defined by the Kanmantu trough and the sediments to the east, sediment volcanic package to the east. You can see there in the slide that there's a bunch of yellow. This is a surface map. They're all, that's all uh, Cenozoic cover over the Kanmantu province. And in fact, of the Kanmantu province itself, there's only about 5% that's um, not under cover and all the rest is under upwards of 300 metres plus of that Cenozoic Murray Basin and, and Quaternary cover. So what we know about the, that whole province is Tom Wise and um, uh, others have given some representations of the drilling that they've done as sort of almost point uh, spaced uh, looks at a basement. But the most continuous uh, exposure of it is in the Kanmantu trough around our Kanmantu mine. So Kanmantu mine, in fact, forms the greatest piece of knowledge we have about the processes affecting the Kanmantu province through the Delamere and beyond. As Tom was also great to introduce yesterday, that in fact it's not just a 510 to 490 period, it's in fact a 510 to 390 a period of magmatic and fluid activity operating in that Kanmantu province. And as I said before, Kanmantu is a window to that. We um, therefore put our own kind of mineral system model together based on what we observe around the Kanmantu mine. So we've been working with uh, the exposure of the pit, a bunch of structural systems, geochem, petrology, over several years now, which we're trying to now fit in together into a cohesive kind of model to use from Kanmantu then to rank all of the geophysical and the geochemical and the, and the artifacts that geophysicists pull out of much data. And which one do you go looking at? when it's all undercover elsewhere. And what we find as we're putting this, this model together that in fact, it is a pulsing ther thermodynamic system of fluids occurring between 510 and about uh, 460, 470 in our, in our system uh, over, I know it's about a 50 million year of early dynamic metamorphism overprinted by thermal metamorphism of multiple events uh, introducing fluids that are changing with time or different fluids as they're, as they're uh, trapping and then being released. The copper is late. It infills any fracture it can find as a plumbing system within that. A retrograde thermal system. There's just a couple of slides there, uh, photos. So they're garnets, they're andalusites that occur in proximity to the ore zone. You can see they're brecciated there and those, bre the, those cracks are infilled with our chalcopyrite uh, chloride event, clearly post. The one on, on the other side is a, 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 just a hand rock specimen. It's about, uh, um, I was gonna say inches, it was about six inches, but maybe that's uh, about 15 centimetres. Um, uh, again, showing the banding, the rock, the bedding, cross-cut by the, the infill fractures. When you get a nice uh, exposure of the brecciation uh, that's in field, you can see here in, some, in this particular slide a picture of our drill core that's a nice uh, uh, plus 4% copper intersection from the mine side. The bismuth model, it is a bismuth melt type model. You get uh, a copper gold, uh, but the copper gold correlation coefficient is about 0.2, but, copper, but gold bismuth is about 0 0.7, 0 0.75. And when uh, pretty well any time you see the bismuth kicking around the system, you'll see the gold associated with it. But gold is also uh, associated with magnetite cracking, within pyrotite cracking, within chalcopyrite cracking uh, uh, throughout the system. So it's, it's kind of overprinting everything else as, as distinct from the other minerals. We get this retrograde uh, metamorphic process uh, occurring um, through the system. We, we've done, oh, I can't tell you, a couple of hundred petrological slides now over a course of years throughout the system uh, to kind of identify this parogenesis. It's very uh, consistent. Doesn't matter where in the Kanban system we are or whether we're a kilometre away from it. We see this alteration system working consistently. It's always a, a copper, always being late. So, we, we, we've looked at that mineral system. We've then gone outside uh, into the rest of the Kanmantu province where there's only a couple of drill holes. The next best prospect drilled out in the southeast is a project called Sherlock, discovered by the Geol Survey. In fact, I think, I don't know if Peter Hill's here, he sat on the rig at the time, uh, uh, and they intersected a uh, zinc, copper, silver, bismuth, tungsten uh, 
system there. In fact, when you pull it all apart and have a look at the petrology of the alteration and the veining parogenesis, it's almost identical to Canman 2. Okay, the copper is late, it's overprinting, higher temperature uh, silicates, it's an it's a iron silicate uh, system that's operating at Sherlock. So there's kind of now a validation of what we've seen at Canman 2 itself further out in the basin, uh, uh, 150 kilometres away. So, uh, and the final bit is that when we go looking at drill holes that have intersected sediments in the Canman 2 province, as far down as Keith in the southeast, that you get this same dynamic metamorphism, overprinted by thermal metamorphism, and then the copper being associated uh, as a late infill model. You can see here in this uh, slide some of the Sherlock um, uh, uh, slides, uh, in particular the top one, the pink one, they're garnets again, and there's a chalcopyrite vein uh, transcutting through that particular garnet as part of validation of our model. So uh, prospects, prospects, prospects. I said we've got 75, I think, in the title slide. Look at some number greater than 70. I didn't think 100 was believable, and we've got far more than two, so I chose a number that was skewed to be more than believable. The, based on geophysics, any kind of geochem, how do you rank these? Well, we've decided to apply a mineral systems model into the ranking of these projects as a way of uh, upscaling you know, the, the system that's at CAMAN2 into something that's uh, possibly much greater and better within this uh, Cambro or Division province. And uh, to do that, we've compiled a whole bunch of all of the data. It's taken us quite a while and added data into that where we find gaps. So we've done a heap more petrological work through there, another couple of hundred slides out of um, uh, a remote holes stored at Tonsley. I said last year at SAMIC, what a great uh, team of people they are down there and, and continue to express uh, great delight in working with them. Um, uh, uh, our gravity and infill and basement and, and uh, geophysical interps to generate these targets. And what did we find after all of that um, compilation work? That in fact, there are a bunch of projects uh, and opportunities through there that uh, uh, are evidence of this CANMAN2 mo model continuing to occur throughout that 5,000 square k's. You know, a drill hole, 75 metres, garnet, chloride, magnetite alteration attend with attended sulphides. Um, it wasn't ever followed up at the time because it didn't meet the syngenetic model that people were exploring for. Um, and we found that continued to exist throughout the southeast. What do you do to try to justify you know, which, which project, which prospect is worthy of drilling? And so we've tried to rank these uh, projects, not just on was there a drill hole nearby and followed up with another one, as so often happens in our junior exploration space. We're not just going to go and drill a mag anomaly, which has happened in the past a lot because it's all undercover. Mags is available. There's a spot high. We'll go and thump a hole into it. So out of all the drill holes down in the southeast that went through basement, the, 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 there's less than 100 you know, over you know 6,000 square k's. The vast majority of those have hit some type of volcanic because or intrusive because they're targeting a mag anomaly. Who wants to drill a featureless geophysical terrain? So uh, uh, there is a limitation, therefore, in, in, in applying this model at this point in time. So what we've tried to do is to see if there's any surface geochemical response through the Cenozo cover. And before you laugh uh, about trying to find geochem signatures in sand dunes, uh, we've actually discovered that it is possible that this, this, this tertiary system and the Cenozoic has been stable long enough as it's grown that in fact there are sufficient geochemical signatures that with our assaying technologies and, and uh, uh, lower limited detections that are available to us and with selective sampling of the type of material that you're looking for, uh, uh, looking to assay, that in fact you can identify regional geochemical anomalies. So they're not uh, that you can go and drill that spot high but they are enabling us to understand where in the silicate packages there may be greater uh, metalliferous fertility or pathfinder fertility than, than other areas. So it's a, 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 a discriminant. We applied for an ADI uh, grant to undertake that work and, um, and very thankful for that. It's enabled to do it. Uh, oh, sorry, in that previous slide, if you'd look carefully while I was boringly talking, uh, you would have seen uh, some of that responses. 
what, what the geochemistry is kind of showing up is um, um, you know, applying all these um, algorithms for data analysis that there in, in fact are geochemical groupings and in fact they're magmatic type groupings uh, here, copper moly, antimony, tin tungsten, uh, antimony arsenic, uh, tin tungsten, these uh, uh, tin tellurium silurium. So they're not kind of copper zinc type uh, things, they're, they're in fact magmatic elements that we're seeing in the surface cover. Now it's not everywhere. As we know, sadly, the world's not homogenous and uh, certainly you get mobile dunes and nothing works. But, but it has provided another layer of discrimination when we're working in relatively uh, non-responsive geophysical terrain. And out of that, we, we, we do find that there are uh, various anomalies. So this is another one. Um, strong, copper moly, tungsten anomalies in, an, in another past drill hole down in the southeast where people really haven't been thinking about these copper epigenetic models sitting down there hosted in mafic and biotite schists. Retrograde thermal from high temperature case bar through to the sulphides, through to the epicarbonate uh, pyrite as an end member. Proximal to major uh, structural zones. So we're quite enthused about these sorts of responses that are coming up. Cook Basin, another one. We could go on, but I'll run out of time. So we've built a, a, a model. We're starting to look through the past literature uh, through the drilling, doing our own subsampling for now multi-suite, putting together a suite of samples, enable to a suite of projects, and ranking those against a uh, a, a copper epigenetic model uh, that's uh, in a, an accordion thermodynamic uh, space that therefore has the opportunity to scale up to being a very significant asset for both Hillgrove and for the state. Uh, what's the next one? Cobra. What a great name for a, um, uh, something that's going to hit the market and turn it on its head. It, does this, it has the same uh, um, contributions. So we're using Canman 2 style as a ranking tool. Petrology, the model, sediment hosted, and we're prioritising based on uh, our similarity to models. Are there other styles possible? Yes. But we don't have enough evidence to put those together at this point in time. So just a couple of examples there. We get this in a number of the holes, an epithermal, very low temperature, adularia, case bar type, um, epidote carbonate galena, uh, minor copper, uh, situated in a couple of holes. And how that fits into this uh, thermodynamic space, we get to find out. But Tom Ways, uh, yesterday morning, Discovery Day, gave some clues to where that epithermal type system might fit into that southeast province. We have an albite carbonate vein system, copper gold, no bismuth in this whatsoever, despite the gold, and overprinting everything, undeformed, unmetamorphosed, uh, and not destructive. So we've got a couple of models that we're still kind of going to try to put together and uh, see where they lead. So how do you rank uh, greater than 70 deposits, uh, prospects? Uh, we believe that we have successfully identified a series of prospects throughout the southeast that further work will um, uh, develop into significant uh, drill targets for uh, Hillgrove resources. Finally, uh, what's happening with Canman 2 Underground, uh, we are diligently drilling away still out there as we continue to build the resources for uh, the re-establishment of the mining site. You've probably seen in the press our uh, underground uh, drives and ventilation drives have uh, undertaken some work. Uh, sadly for us, the copper price and its demise early this year and the the world's mm, uh, uncertainty uh, in the finance space, to put it politely. Um, uh, if anyone can guess next week's copper price, uh, we'd be delighted to know if it's true or not. The, it's that volatile. And so until we can sort of uh, get a handle with our finances on that volatility, then we'll be able to progress uh, back into underground mining. But uh, in the meantime, the geology team are putting together some outstanding uh, geological processes uh, using uh, current uh, petrology, uh, scanning, um, and machine learning into developing copper grade at the faces. So thank you for your time. I hope you found it an interesting story because you need to watch this space. Thank you.